the stuff you're talking about, the, the tricky balance of moving between sort of concept and, uh, and coding, and that this is a hands-on sort of get down in code kind of week or weeks. And so we're gonna um, start looking at a little bit of code. So you have already heard about this Game of Life example, and that my understanding is that some of you have played around with some of the code already too, so that's good. Um, it may be that it's a there's a little bit of repetition here um, in some cases, then, but, but we'll see how that goes. So, um, you know, I don't know that I need to motivate checkpointing, but um, if you run for a long time on systems, uh, sooner or later you'll you'll have a crash, and it could be your code's fault, it could be the system's fault, it could be the file system's fault. So we write out checkpoints. Um, turns out that we also like to see the results of our simulation, so that's another good reason to write out data. Um, so we're gonna look at a uh, couple of ways of, of writing data from this Game of Life code um, that, that you some of you, again, have totally seen some of the code for already, and we'll, we'll flip through it. We like to write things out in some sort of portable fashion. Um, portability is sort of relative. Maybe that you just want to be able to read it from a different number of processes than you wrote it from. It may be that you need to be able to read it on a, a platform that has a different indianness than the one that you wrote it on. So it, it sort of depends on the on your requirements, how portable something needs to be. Um, one aspect of portability is what we, we call a, a canonical representation. So a representation that's sort of the global representation of the data that's sort of independent of the number of processes. And often that means writing out an array uh, in, a, in a global order, not in some sort of partitioned order. Um, that also helps with restarting with different numbers of processes, although, frankly, most of the time restarting with different numbers of processes is hard because the algorithm isn't really meant to, to work that way. Your partitioning doesn't work quite that way or something like that, not because the I.O. is hard. Um, it also makes uh, data analysis a lot easier when we use uh, this canonical representation because you don't have to figure out how many processes something was written with and deal with that. And actually, I had a, a discussion at the break of uh, translating from this sort of many local views of a data structure into a global view per time step so that that was dealt with uh, prior to analysis. So um, when we're gonna write some data out, we need enough information to restart. Um, for writing out data for analysis purposes, we need enough information to interpret the data file. Um, so uh, oftentimes, we wanna capture some things like the size of the problem we were working on, uh, maybe some of the input parameters to <coughs> to the simulation, um, and then of course the state of the uh, the system, at least enough state that we can get back to where we were in terms of computing, or enough state that we can answer the questions that we have about the simulation. <coughs> we like to write into single files when we can. Um, that's how we're gonna do things here, although we've talked about sort of the pro pros and cons of that already. Many codes run in a mode where it's convenient to checkpoint at roughly the same time, and so that becomes sort of a collective operation in the same sense that uh, we have these MPI collectives, right, where everyone participates, okay? And it turns out that uh, in the same way that we can save time, we can be more efficient in our codes by using collective communication, right? And you guys talked about that, I, I imagine, at, at, at length last week. Um, we can also take advantage of uh, this sort of natural or organizing this natural selectivity of I.O. as a place for us to apply those transformations that we were talking about earlier. And so we're gonna be using collective I.O. Um, and, and what we mean is that all these processes are gonna be making collective I.O. calls. We'll talk about that more. Um, we're gonna define an API. Some of you guys will have seen this. Um, so we're gonna have five functions, an initialized function, a finalized function, a checkpoint, um, a function that lets us know if we can restart or not, and then a restart function. And this will this will make sense in a second. They're all they're all collective, so all processes must make these calls. Um, and we're going to implement three different versions of this. Um, and then I'm just going to stop for a second. You did not talk about this in, with Bill and Rusty, right? Imagine that uh, you have, you have said, okay, I'm going to I'm working on a code, or I'm tired of all this. Uh, spaghetti code of I.O. in my application. I want to build out a little uh, interface for interacting with the storage system in my code, and then I want to stick with that interface, and then I'm going to use that interface even if I decide to change how I map my data model down onto storage later, okay? And so in this case, we've said, 
Well, we're going to have these five functions for interacting with the storage system in this game of life code. And obviously, this is sort of underdefined because we haven't given any parameters to any of these yet. But this does define the way that we're going to interact with the storage system. So we're going to initialize this library, and we're going to have an ability to shut it down. I don't know what those are going to do exactly yet, but that's a good practice, right? Uh, we're going to have a single function that we call when we want to checkpoint. Okay, and it's going to, apparently it's going to do all the I.O. Now, we haven't described out how it's going to do that yet, but it's going to. And similarly, we're going to have a single function that pulls all the data in when we need to restart. And so that's, so you can imagine in, in this Game of Life code that the I.O., uh, the details of the I.O. are pretty much all out of the picture now. And as a user, you don't have to think about it so much anymore. So this is what our uh, checkpoint function is going to look like. This prefix uh, parameter is just a way of setting up a file name. Um, we're going to pass in, this is C code, uh, pass in a pointer to a matrix. Uh, I, only, I only do Fortran code when I'm paid for it, so we're going to talk about C today. You can imagine the same API being mapped over Fortran. We do that sort of thing all the time. Um, we're going to pass in uh, a rows and a columns because in C uh, we can't extract that from the matrix. Uh, we're going to uh, pass in an iteration number that we're going to store in our checkpoint so that when we look at the checkpoint we can uh, verify that uh, this checkpoint represents the iteration that we think it represents. And then we're going to pass in an MPI info. Uh, I imagine you guys heard a little bit about MPI infos last week. Um, it's a, a sort of opaque data structure that you can use in MPI for passing hints around. And while we're not going to really use it um, today, this is a place where you can pass in uh, tuning parameters for I.O. transformations in this case. So you can adjust the buffer sizes and the method of aggregation in data sieving in two phase via those info parameters. So if you were trying to tune your code, this will give you a place to do it. And otherwise, it's a null and doesn't really cost anything. OK? So that's our checkpoint function. That's probably the most important function mm -hmm. um, for now. Um, and the first implementation we're going to look at, uh, which some of you have run and know breaks um, at large scale is a standard out version. Um, all it does is print the standard out. Output looks like this if it runs. Um, and it's m worth mentioning that the MPI standard doesn't actually say that all data from all processes will get back to uh, standard out. Um, so we make a, a somewhat more conservative assumption that rank zero can write the standard out. And so in this implementation, we're going to pass all our data back to rank zero and then print it from there. Um, and so that's relatively portable, obviously not scalable. This is also the way that if you were, um, say you had a very small amount of data that you wanted to output from your application, but it was distributed over a collection of processes, this is a reasonable way to do output from a very large application with a very small number of processes. It's, it's okay to, to push stuff back to rank zero. It's, it's just bad to push everything back to rank zero when there's a whole lot of it. Um, so, so this is, an, this is uh, our first implementation. Um, used to be when we did this, we had two projectors, and that's great because you can look at the code and the slides at the same time. Some of you may have the code around, in which case you're welcome to look at it. Um, I'm going to sort of interleave the, the slides over here. It's less likely that I'll be confused about which projector I'm moving forward and things like that, so maybe easier on you. Um, so all processes are going to call this checkpoint routine. Uh, we're going to describe uh, the global array and what pieces of it um, we have. And then uh, finally, our output is independent of the number of processes, which is the things to sort of remember here. Um, and, and this uh, mlifeio standard out.c is the file. If you, wanna, if you have the code and you want to look at it, um, that's the file to look at. So uh, you've seen code like this before. Um, usual header files, um, prototypes. Uh, th maybe the only interesting prototype here is this mlifeio type create row block. So you were introduced to the type constructor functions in MPI um, last week, type vector, type index, et cetera. Yeah? Think of this as um, a, a custom type constructor that we wrote for convenience inside of this library, OK? So we know that our data is stored in these collections of rows, right? And I just wanted to write up a type constructor that would build a type for a collection of rows without me having to do that multiple times in my code. So that's what I did. Um, and I, I wrote this stuff, so I'm responsible for whatever's wrong with it. Um, so our init, um, all it does is com dupe. 
Is everybody familiar with Tom Dupes? Did we get you to talk about that? Sort of? Well, let's talk about it real quick. So uh, Comdupe takes a communicator and gives you back another communicator of the same size with the ranks in the same order, um, but with what they call a con different context. And the reason you like, we like to do this in libraries is that um, communication on a communicator um, can be received by other processes only in, that, in the context of that communicator. So if I do a receive and I use the same communicator, I might accidentally get a message that I didn't expect to get. So when you write MPI code and you write it and you're using MPI com world, you're making an assumption that messages are arriving in a certain order, that you wrote all the messages, et cetera. When we're writing a library, we don't really know what the user's doing. We don't really know what tags they used on their communication, et cetera. But if we dupe a communicator, we get this new communicator, MPI guarantees that it's sort of logically separated any communication on our new communicator from the old communicator. So if somebody happens to send a message that matches um, our, you know, our rank and tag uh, parameters to our receive, but they use a different communicator, we won't see that message. So there's no way we'll accidentally get some communication we didn't intend. If you build, if you make hundreds of thousands of communicators like this, it's a performance problem, but having a half dozen or a dozen or even a hundred communicators in your application isn't a big deal. So this is a safety net thing that um, when that grad student's hacking on your code and screws up their communication, it won't show up in your library, right? That kind of thing. Hey, fun story. That happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, we had a parallel NCS been around for eight years. Uh, two summers ago, a student came in and like, I got this weird problem, I got alt all v and I get this weird report from this weird crazy bug report, bug backtrace from mempitch, and what's going on? And well, it turns out we weren't duping the communicator inside Parallel CDF, so uh, it, it was indeed a, a, a maddening bug to figure out. It was just it was a stupid little problem, and so yeah, you should do that. Okay, um, and so then uh, the way to get rid of that communicator so that you uh, are all nice and clean at the end of your run is to um, free it at the end in a finalized function. Um, there's some trickier stuff you could do by putting attributes on communicators and stuff, but we're not going to do that. All right, so here's our function. Um, we've already talked about the parameters. Um, we're going to get our communicator size and rank. Um, from that, we're going to use a couple of functions that you probably saw at least one of last week, which um, figures out how many rows uh, a given um, process owns and what the starting row is for that process in our distribution, right? So that's pretty simple. So this is just um, internal to our uh, Life I/O, um, figuring out what block of rows uh, a given process is responsible for. And so, you know, the only thing to keep in mind here is that this checkpoint routine um, sort of assumes a particular distribution of data, right? So we'd have to rewrite this if we decided to go with a block block distribution or something like that. Um, here, if we're not rank zero, we're going to use that type constructor to build a type that describes uh, the local rows. We're going to commit that type. We're going to send that uh, off to uh, rank zero. And then we're going to free the type. All right, so everybody else just builds a type, describes the region, dumps it into a buffer, comes back, and uh, is finished up. Um, rank zero is going to uh, first print out a little header, and then um, print its own data, this row print, so it prints a row at a time, and then go into a loop, um, receiving, uh, allocating some space, receiving data from another process, rank in, rank I, and then printing its rows. And so you can imagine you might not be able to allocate enough space. There's a lot of reasons why this might uh, go awry, um, but for small scale, this works pretty well. Um, and then there's this little sleep down here that's just so that if you're running this on your command line, you can watch it progress. Otherwise, it runs really fast and there's, it's not aesthetically pleasing. Okay, so um, it's worth sort of talking a little bit about how that Roblox function works. So uh, the data that we need in our checkpoint is actually just this stuff in the red box. Um, we have some data from other processes, but that's already stored in the other processes, so we don't need that stuff. Um, same here. And then uh, these edge um, cells are also um, well-defined, so we don't need to store those either. Now, I'm overdoing it here. Um, sending not so much data 
or even storing not so much data. A couple of rows here and there is not a big deal. But uh, this gives us an opportunity to talk about, you know, one, not storing any more in our checkpoints than we have to, right, which is good practice. And two, how you construct a type that does something like this, which um, isn't always intuitive, but it's good to understand. And so uh, the way that we did this uh, was first that to recognize that this is sort of a vector type. Uh, if we, our vector starts here, then we have um, a block length of this length, and then we have a stride that goes from here to the beginning of the next one. Okay, so we can talk about this as a vector, um, but if we were to just pass in our, our pointer to this matrix and then talk about a vector from there, the vector would be in the wrong place. And so uh, the way we get that memory offset right, I, I, I abused a, a type H indexed. Um, so I say, there's a, oh, there's one type. It has a length of, of one of its types. And then I use the displacement of the first element in the matrix to effectively get the offset that I want. Okay, So it's just sort of games we play with MPI types. So we'll see that here. Um, here's the type vector. Here I'm getting the address of that element in the matrix back out and uh, creating that H index type. And then I'm freeing the vector type because there's still a reference to it here, so I can free that. And this way, when I pass this new type back and it gets freed, uh, the vector type is also, uh, is also free to go. Okay, so this isn't meant to be an MPI tutorial, but does that more or less make sense? And so that's it for the that so complicated function that I didn't want to have to copy the code around on. We can't restart from standard out because we can't read from standard out like that. And so our restart will, will pass an error if we if um, we call it. Okay, so that is a pretty straightforward implementation of the init finalize checkpoint can restart and restart functions intended really for debugging. Now is a good point to ask questions about that simple implementation if you have one. But you guys have been doing this sort of stuff for a week and a half, so you're good to go. All right, cool. So let's parallelize this thing. Um, <coughs> so uh, to get a benefit out of a parallel file system, we know that we probably need more than one process writing. Um, so we're going to run a uh, game of life on a very large number of processes. We need to get uh, more than one uh, process writing. Um, and I sort of mentioned this earlier, MPI is a pretty good setting for Palo I.O. because it has a lot of constructs uh, that we need um, when uh, um, interacting with a, in a parallel I.O. system. Um, it has collective operations, has a notion of groups of processes. Before we even say it has collective operations, you can describe groups of processes in MPI. That's pretty important. You can't do that in a file system. It's a real problem if you want to do parallel I.O. at that level. Um, you can talk about the relationships between those processes. So they're not just a group, they're an ordered group. So we can say, oh, everybody wants to send a rank n minus one, and we know everybody knows the same order. Um, we have this uh, ability to describe these data types, and we can use those data types in memory, but it turns out we can also use those to describe uh, regions in file. And the reason that's important is it allows us to talk about many regions with a single descriptor, right? And not have to talk about a region at a time, for example, which is what we tend to do with the file system imp implementations or uh, interfaces today. Um, we have this communicator that allowed us to separate messaging so that we don't um, mismatch messages like we, w w like we have. And it has some non-blocking capabilities also, so we could describe an I.O. and then come back later and see whether it's completed. Although, without getting into the details, don't count on that actually operating the way you expect in today's systems. Um, that's dinner time talk, I think. So, so a lot of constructs that are really useful for, for MPI, or for I.O. Um, we've talked about uh, collective I.O. a little bit already. Um, you know, again, everybody has to call the function. You're used to that because you've seen some MPI collectives. Um, and what it's allowing us to do here is get a big picture view of, of what all the processes want to do, which then sets us up for uh, for example, applying this two-phase optimization where we reorganize data across processes and then push it out. And in fact, the way that we implement two-phase in most cases is by um, performing MPI communication between those processes inside the library and then doing I.O. for writes anyway. Um, and so this is a simple notion. You, you know more than this already, but we want to take little things and we want to reorganize them 
and interact um, in a sort of more structured way with the storage system. There are books on MPIIO. I don't like listing functions, so we're not going to do that. Um, you can read, so <laughs> I won't do that to you. Um, I'm happy to talk about details of, of the MPIO API and uh, consistency semantics and all that sort of stuff at dinner or in the hands-on session. Um, what we're going to do here is use exactly the functions that we need in order to accomplish um, our goal, which is checkpoint and restart for this little code. And that'll give you a feel for how the, uh, the API works and it'll touch on uh, some of the most important calls. Say maybe the most complicated call that we're going to interact with today or, or show today is MPI file write at all. The underscore all uh, is used in the I.O. routines to indicate a collective function. It's not the same in, in the MPI communication functions. They, they don't do that for you, but they do. All the underscore all functions are collective in the MPI I.O. interface. The underscore at um, means that we're going to pass in a, a position descriptor as part of our call. There's also a flavor of these calls that don't have that, that use an internal sort of file descriptor. If you've done uh, standard I.O. before or uh, Unix I.O. or that sort of thing, you're used to this notion of I move the file position to somewhere and then I write. You can do that in MPI I.O. also. These underscore at calls combine those two functions together. Right, so that's the flavor I prefer. You guys are, are very bright and probably don't have to be told this, but um, you don't have to pass all the same parameters into these functions. It wouldn't make any sense to write the same bytes to the same places or different bytes to the same places. So uh, one process might write nothing. Another process might write a header. Another process might write a collection of rows. Passing in that you're interacting with the same file, um, but you're going to get to describe different sets of data, and we're going to take advantage of that. Um, so we're going to use a, a user-defined uh, MPI data type to talk about local data and, and local header information. Um, we're going to use this thing called an MPI offset to talk about where we're interacting in the file. Um, and it used to be that um, files larger than two gigs were a big deal. Um, I'm not sure that that's, that probably is still true somewhere. Actually, I know that's still true some places, but it's not that big a deal. And uh, we're going to use... Uh, process zero is going to is going to take care of our header for us. Uh, when when we define an API, we also have to define um, if we're going to interact with files, how we're going to store data in a file. So we define an API. We defined a, a set of parameters to those calls. Now what we're defining is our mapping from this rough data model of a, of a matrix and some uh, header elements or some some provenance information to how we're going to store that in the file. Okay. And the way we're going to store that in the file is very simple. Uh, we're going to store uh, an integer rows, an integer columns, an integer iteration as the first three integers in the file. And then we're going to dump all of our data out um, in, in row block order also as integers. OK, that's a really terrible uh, checkpoint format for a game of life, by the way, because we're using integers where we have single bits, right? But we're going to look at some code. Uh, we're going to see that we can, in fact, write that entire file uh, with a single MPI file write at all from each process, so that's good. Um, and then we're going to see that on restart, we're going to perform two steps. First, we're going to have everybody read uh, the rows and columns um, to sort of verify that we've got what we expect in terms of the dimensions of the array. A note, sometimes that's faster to just read in one place and broadcast. Either way is okay. Um, and then assuming that those match up, we're going to use a second call to read uh, the, the data out of the file. And because we wrote it in this sort of global order, if you start with a different number of processes than you um, started with, that's okay. Um, so I'm going to skip uh, some code and go straight to the interesting stuff. Um, it took me six years to realize I didn't have to show you the header files for uh, this file also. Um, I'm a slow learner. All right, so here we are. So um, this is uh, the checkpoint function for uh, written for MPIIO. Um, so we have an access mode. We're going to only write, and we would really like this file to be created if it's not there. And uh, we're the only people that are going to be interacting with this file. So we're, this isn't really much used by most implementations, but it's sort of a promise to the MPI implementation that we're not going to mess with the file some other way at the same time. MPI uh, references files via these MPI file file handles. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to open the file and we're going to get back this FH, this MPI file file handle that's our sort of 
um, reference to the open file inside of our, our library, okay? So same stuff, rows and offsets. Um, SNPrintf is a convenient way to create a file name, which we need now because we're actually interacting with a storage system. MPI file open. Um, we're taking that communicator that we duped, so all of our processes are opening. Uh, they're opening this file name. They're opening for write-only, et cetera. We're passing in that set of info parameters that we might have used for tuning, although we haven't so far. Um, and we're going to get a reference back. And then this is just making sure that second page of this function, if we're rank zero, we're going to create a type called mlifeio type create header row block. So you can imagine, um, with my careful naming of functions, that this might be a row block with a header on the front of it, right? And it is, and we'll see that in a minute. Everybody else is just going to write out their row block, okay? And then the second thing of interest here is everyone is figuring out an offset, and for the first r rank, rank zero, they're going to write the beginning of the file. Everyone else is writing at their offset times columns, right? Um, plus the three header elements times the size of an int. So we've had to hand calculate where we're going to put our data in the file, but it's really not that not that bad, right? For this simple format, okay. And then uh, we're going to commit those types, and then we're going to file write at all. Everybody passes in their own independent offsets, so they're writing in different regions. Uh, this MPI bottom, um, you may have already heard about, is a way of sort of saying that the uh, address is already in the type, is, is the best way to describe that, um, and they're going to pass in their type. So rank zero is going to write out this header plus its block of rows starting at offset zero, and everyone else is going to write out their block of rows at an appropriate offset. Um, then we'll free the type, close the file. Okay, so that's um, writing a relatively simple output format in MPIIO using collective functions. So three MPIIO functions to write. And this sort of does everything that we'd like people to do when they can with um, MPIIO. So does this make sense? Okay. So the only uh, remaining, uh, two remaining complicated things, uh, one is the restart, and we'll just show you that. It looks very similar. We're opening, but this time we're reading only, right? Um, and we're not trying to create the file. That would be kind of silly. Um, and then we're going to call MPI file read at all on a very small buffer of three integers. So I, I lied earlier. I'm actually reading the iteration also. My bad. Um, and then we're going to do an all reduce um, to make sure that everyone actually uh, was able to read. So no error. And um, their, their rows and columns look like what they expected. I'll leave it to you to figure out the logic on that, but this is sort of everybody um, ensuring that, I'm sorry, this is that they're read correctly, and then everyone is also checking that, that the rows and columns match what was input to the function or input to the application. Um, then they're going to create that row block, uh, calculate their file offset, and read the data, just the data from the file in a second, second function. Um, so the, the question was, um, shouldn't the rows and columns be um, output functions, uh, output parameters from the function? And similarly, shouldn't we be allocating the matrix in this function and then passing it out? So I made a decision in building this API, and, and you'll see this in the code that, that's calling this API, that the code was responsible for uh, uh, input parameters and part of those input parameters were the rows and the columns and whether or not it was restarting. And so for consistency purposes, when you run this code, you, you, you give it a set, you know, it's got a number of processes, you get it a, give it a rows and a columns and you tell it whether it ought to restart or not, okay? And so in that context, with that decision made, then those become uh, input parameters to this function. So that extra function is allocating space and then, um, verifying that the rows and columns are correct. A different decision, absolutely reasonable decision, would be to say, well, when this application is run in restart mode, it is going to pull from the restart file the rows and columns and, um, and use those parameters and allocate the space. That would have been a perfectly reasonable thing to do. I just didn't happen to do that. Yes? Okay, so the, I, I misun misunderstood the question. The question is, was it better to, would it be better to just go ahead and read the go cells as 
part of the restart or to exchange the ghost cells after the fact. I, I honestly don't know. My intuition tells me it's probably a, a wash um, because what would happen is um, in the file read at all, one of two things would happen. Either there would be additional data read from processes or if two phases are being done, data would be exchanged out to multiple people uh, as part of the exchange phase of the two phase in the read at all. You're sort of doing that yourself. Um, in if, if, if you don't do that in this function, then you're sort of doing that yourself elsewhere. It's probably a wash. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. All right, now we got started. Okay. If you start with a different number of processors, um, I think the, the point was you could still write uh, this global view as I described it, and then you just read whatever it is that you happen to need in terms of the extra rows. So you read a row earlier and a row later. So you can start with a different number of processes and still be, still be fine. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a, it's a good point. It's a good point. And, and the answer is it, it depends a little bit, but probably it, it's not. Either way, it's probably fine. It comes down more to what you want your API to do, I think, than which of those is a little bit faster. Um, you know, you could. I chose not to have the restart function doing memory allocation and so forth, but um, I mean, it does memory allocation, but not global, not, not long term memory allocation. So, Rob, from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, the mere fact that you're doing collective I/O at all puts you in the upper, you know, <laughs> 90th percentile of applications in this case, and then so. You know, at that point, yeah, it's, it's a wash because you're already getting most of the performance gains you would anyway. So, uh, so yeah. whoever's easiest to code up. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah, and it really comes down to, you know, how how you want to construct this API, right? Um, okay, so um, you know we we've already presented this sort of row block function before. Uh, this isn't going to be too too surprising. Um, this is the header row block version. Um, you need a few more uh, variables in order to, to use the struct type that we're going to use to describe everything. Um, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to use the old row block function to describe the, the collection of rows that uh, rank zero is going to um, write, right? So this is used in our checkpoint function. Um, second thing we're going to do is get the addresses of our rows, columns, and iteration values, okay? And uh, then we're going to set up the input parameters for a struct data type. And so a struct data type takes um, links, displacements, and types. So the, the thing that a struct type lets you do is describe a collection of different uh, underlying types. And so. In this case, um, it's three ints, um, so I, I could have used an index, uh, but I didn't. Um, I'm missing something here. Oh, I'm sorry. There, <laughs> that's interesting. That ought to be a four. All right, so there's a bug. Um, Unless I'm missing something. We'll, we'll look back at it later, but I'm pretty sure that's a bug. All right, so yeah, that's definitely a bug. And the reason that we don't see that bug is we typically just run this in the standard I.O. mode. So that should be a four. So there's four types here. I, now I understand why I, my, I was staring at this code and something seemed wrong, and now I know what it is. What it is is that we are passing in, uh, as parameters to the struct, um, that we have an integer for rows, an integer for columns, an integer for iterations. And then we have this fourth type, which is our row block. Right? And that's why we need a destruct. Um, likewise, we need displacements for um, the rows, columns, iterations, and also a displacement for the row block, which we use as MPI bottom for reasons described earlier. So then we create a struct out of it. So we have all three of these integers plus the row block. That's four things, and so this ought to be a four. Um, so there's a bug to fix. <laughs> Um, and so once we have that, uh, we can free the row block because there's still a reference to it inside the struct, and then we can return the struct type as our new type, uh, or it, it gets passed back out by, by reference. Okay. Um, so this is just a, a way of, of describing um, 
an additional set of non-contiguous, you know, additional set of memory regions and tacking them onto this collection of rows that we already have, okay? All right, so we're going to talk about, we're not going to talk about building an I.O. API for sparse matrices, actually. The slides are, are in um, the PDF, and there's code for this in that um, example code, if you're interested in it. It's an interesting example. It takes a very long time to go through, and it's pretty complicated. It's a CSR um, version. It has a nice example of how to deal with uh, variable amounts of data from different processes, so it's useful for that. Uh, we're going to talk about that later today anyway, though, so we're going to skip over this. Um, but you have the code if you're interested in it. We could talk about it this afternoon as well. And you have the slides that describe it. Um, so um, just to sort of wrap up the MPIO discussion and give you an opportunity to ask a couple more questions before we move on, um, you know, sometimes it makes sense to build your own MPIO, build your own IO API, first of all, which we're, we're doing. That often makes sense. Um, and to implement that in terms of MPIO. Um, and particularly if you or your community has a particular sort of special data format that it tends to use, you've been using that for a long time, you have a bunch of data in that format and, and a bunch of tools that process that, that data, you may not want to adopt some new library that writes data out in some new way and then fix all of your analysis tools to use that. In that case, it may make a lot of sense to spend the time to write your data out using MPIO. Um, additionally, if you already have a solution for writing out the little bit of data that you need for analysis and you really just need a really fast implementation of something that dumps out your checkpoint data, again, you may just want to write your binary, you know, you may just want to write your data out from your application straight into uh, files without the translation layers and so forth that come from some of these data model libraries. And we have users that do that. So they'll use, in fact, um, Rob will speak to the hack code later, uses um, POSIX and MPIIO to write out checkpoint data, uh, and they get very good performance that way, uses um, Parallel Net CDF in their case to write out their particle data for analysis purposes, and then they can share that data with others. Um, it's got uh, additional metadata captured with it, easier to analyze, right? So that's something that does happen. Um, I've only touched on the API here. I promise not to give you a lot of functions. I think we looked at um, four MPIO, fun we, were, we were able to do checkpoint and restart with four MPIO functions, or read a write open and a close. That's pretty good. Um, there are some more functions. Uh, there are functions that allow you to do uh, IO independently, so it doesn't always work out that everybody's on the same page. So there's a capability for that. Um, there's also a, a concept of file views, which is a way of describing data that's not contiguous in your file, um, which can be pretty important when you're writing out data that's not in these big, uh, convenient uh, blocks of row format, right? So if you need to skip around in the file logically, you can describe that, and then Two-Face can reorganize for you. Um, in general, though, um, if, if those those cases don't apply to you, um, we're, we're generally going to suggest, maybe gently encourage um, you to adopt one of these libraries that we're going to describe in detail later today um, for a number of reasons, uh, not, the, not the least of which is um, it makes it a lot easier for people to look at your code and figure out uh, what the I.O. system is doing than if you've hand-coded a bunch of MPIO functionality. Um, it, it, in other words, we sort of understand how things work from an HDF or a NetCDF layer down. And so when a performance engineer looks at your code, that it's an easier starting point, my opinion anyway. Um, Quincy, I, I can't tell whether he agrees or not. Yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we're going to look at uh, one more example using the Game of Life. Um, and that example is going to be um, using one of these data model libraries, in this case, Parallel NetCDF. Um, one of two pretty popular ones. Uh, there's some more, and Rob will give us the list later on. Um, the things that, that this is going to do for us that we're going to like, one is that we're not going to have to think about offsets in the file anymore, which wasn't too bad in this uh, Game of Life case, but gets complicated pretty quickly. Uh, for example, the moment you want to put more than one array in your file, it starts to get pretty complicated. 
Um, it also gives us sort of a standard format, and there's tools that can uh, interrogate these files, and we'll look at that uh, in, in greater detail later in the day. And um, these formats capture some metadata for us. So when we define a variable, it's going to be defined in terms of the dimensions, and those dimensions are going to be stored, that information about the dimensions will be stored in the file along with our data. And so we don't have to go and deal with that stuff ourselves. For parallel machines, uh, these kinds of libraries uh, almost always use MPI for communicating between uh, processes underneath their interface. And most of the time, or maybe not most of the time, often use MPIIO uh, in interacting with the underlying storage system. Sometimes they bypass that, and uh, sometimes MPIIO isn't as fast as it should be on certain machines, and so that's a reasonable thing to do, but you won't have to worry about that. You, so again, I, I think we've, we've seen this picture before, but just to remind us, um, this data model is fairly simple. We get a, uh, the ability to describe arrays um, and attributes, and um, then uh, the data model library is responsible for figuring out what goes where in the file. In this case, in SCDF, you define a variable, and it saves information on those variables up near the front of the file, and then sort of points to where that starts later in the file. When we actually use NetCDF, um, we're going to be talking about parallel NetCDF. Um, there is a serial version that's been around a long time. It's used in a lot of tools that don't use MPI. Um, on our BlueGene machine, for example, NetCDF builds on top of IBM's MPI. IBM's MPI communicates with uh, that CIOD infrastructure that we talked about earlier, and that interacts with the file system. So this is the I.O. stack. If we were running this code on our BlueGene system, um, we would have this, this I.O. stack, right? Uh, and so we could think about, uh, and similar if we were run on, say, the TAC machine, a cluster, um, we'd be running with parallel net CDF. I think they've got uh, MVAPitch on there, maybe, uh, which has uh, the Romeo MPIO component in it, and that would then interact with Lustre. In this walkthrough, uh, we're similarly going to store the, we're going to have a similar format for the data. Um, we're going to store uh, our iteration as an integer. Uh, and then we're going to store uh, a, a, our matrix as a variable called matrix uh, with these dimensions. And, um, and our processes will write out the data in the same way they did before in terms of these global ordering. So checkpoint function, NetCDF uh, uses integer identifiers when it's talking about uh, components uh, in its data model. Um, this stuff you've seen before, my rows and my offset, we're creating a file name again. .nc is a pretty common um, suffix for NetCDF files. And here we're, op we're creating the file ncmpi-create um, is sort of the MPI file open equivalent. It creates the file. Um, it creates it collectively using a communicator. So we've done that dupe communicator thing again. Um, file name, uh, this is the mode we're opening in. And just like in MPI.io, we pass in an info parameter that allows us to pass in some hints, and we get back a reference to that new open file or open data set uh, in CID, okay? And we check to make sure that that succeeded. So we're about to do some I.O. in that CDF, right? And so when we um, write data in that CDF, there's a couple of different flavors of interfaces for writing data. This one allows us to use MPI data types, which is convenient because we already have some code for describing data and memory with MPI data types. The way to think about this function, uh, ncmpi put, put means write. I don't know why they did that. Um, var a uh, means that we're going to put a variable, uh, and, and uh, really it's a subarray. Um, they used s for something else, so we, we use a. Um, and underscore all to indicate this is a collective call. We're going to write into this data set and a, a variable that we'll show you how to define in a second. And this variable ID and start and count define what variable in the data in the NetCDF file and where in that NetCDF file this data is going to go. Okay, so this is I want you to put some stuff here, and then this buffer and count and data type are just like we used on the MPI side, and they describe where the data is in memory that we want to put into this region in the file. Okay. And similar to in the MPIIO case, um, what's going to happen is this is a collective call, and so all of our processes are going to write all of their data with a single single call, single collective call. And underneath this, then, 
Uh, we call MPIO, our IO transformations occur, and then we interact with the storage system. Okay, I know that was a lot, but you get to see this again in a second. Okay. Whew. There's a lot going on in this slide. Um, so, first thing that we do is we define some dimensions. Okay, now remember I said the NetCDF model holds on to this data about the dimensions of variables and the names of variables and things like that. So we have to tell it that stuff. The way we tell it that stuff is by calling functions and passing in parameters that define these things. And so here we are defining a dimension called call um, that is um, of column dimensions, uh, of, of column units, and getting back a reference to it. And here we're passing, we're creating a dimension called row, which is of size you know, it has, has rows dimensions, or has rows elements, rather, and getting back a reference to that new dimension. So we've, we've created these two dimensions that then we can apply when we're making a variable, if that makes sense. So when you create a variable in NetCDF, you say, I would like a variable, I would like it to be of some type, and I would like it to have these dimensions in this order. And that's what we're about to do, okay? So that's what we're doing right here. So we're saying, here's an array of dimensions. Um, columns go fastest, rows go second. So we would like to define a variable in this NetCDF data set or file that we created. We would like that variable to be called matrix. We would like it to hold integers. It has two dimensions. And here are the dimensions, the column and the row. And we'll get back a variable, a reference to that variable. So now we have a reference to our matrix variable. So that was a lot in five lines, I guess, but um, that's sort of the, the pattern for creating variables in that CDF. And you'll see a slightly different pattern, uh, but, but that has many of the same concepts in, in the HDF example. Uh, so now just to, to show you how it works, we're going to put an attribute, an integer attribute on the, on the data set also. And so here we're very quickly saying, hey, um, please put this attribute, it's an integer, um, and uh, it's called iter, and we just like to put it on the file. We, you can also associate them with variables, but we didn't do that in this case. And so now, if we want to later, and we'll show this, we can query and see uh, what iteration this data set corresponds to. Um, here we're ending uh, define mode in def. It's a, it's a concept that's in uh, NetCDF, serial and parallel NetCDF, and the idea is that and when you're creating a data set in NetCDF, you describe everything that you want in the data set, and then later you can write variables, bulk data, okay? And the advantage to that, uh, I'm gonna back up a couple of slides. The advantage to that is that NetCDF can figure out everything that goes in this header ahead of time and figure out where it wants all these variables to be located ahead of time. And so then when you get into writing this data, there's not additional communication needed to sort of um, arbitrate who's gonna write what where, right? There's a single place where, um, in this example, the temperature array belongs, and in fact, where any given element of that temperature array belongs, and everybody knows that, okay? All right, so when we say in def, right here, we said, we have just told you everything that's gonna go in this file. Um, so you've seen these functions before. Uh, create row block is familiar. This is that descriptor that I that I mentioned before of um, this process saying, okay, I, I'm going to start at, at column zero. I'm always going to start at column zero because I'm writing full rows. Um, and this is my offset in rows. And I'm going to write out again full full columns. So I'm going zero to columns and um, write out a total of my rows. And I bet there's an off by one there. I bet we got a second bug. We're doing great. We're debugging. We're debugging on the fly. Um, so, and the, the reason it works is that we've got those um, we've got those uh, ghost cells on the outsides or the defined types on the outside. So it, it, you never see that bug except that it's there. Okay. Um, so we've got our type uh, create row block, uh, and here's our collective function for writing all the data out. So um, we open the file up on the previous slide, we define this variable. Sorry, I, I thought that was a, a pay attention to me. Um, we put in this attribute, 
Now we're writing all of our da data, and as I described on that previous slide, a variable and uh, location in that variable, this is where the data is going, and then MPI bottom, one of our row blocks is where the data is in memory, and that's it. Our, uh, our data all moves, our processes may exchange data and transform the I.O. operations, it all gets written to the file, um, we free the type, we close the netcdf file and we're done with our checkpoint. Um, the restart, um, because I'm a little bit I'm closing in on the end of time, um, we'll maybe be a little short here, but um, similarly, MPI open, um, if you pass in a zero mode, that means I'm reading. Um, it also means that you don't start in define mode, um, so we're not going to see that in depth in this case. Um, what is interesting about the next bit of code is this inquiry function. And so this is where um, these uh, data model libraries kind of shine, okay? I, these libraries give you an ability to interrogate a data set about what's in the data set, okay? Now we're gonna take advantage of some known information here because I wanted to keep this example simple, but Rob's gonna show you later how you can take a data set that you know nothing about and look at what's in that data set and interrogate it, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna shortcut some stuff because we do know or we have expectations about what's gonna be in our data set here. For example, what we can do in this case is we can say, um, give me um, the length of a dimension, uh, given a dimension reference, given one of those references to a dimension, please let me know um, how long that dimension is, right? So I can check to see if the number of columns that I expect is the number of columns in the variable, for example. Um, so we'll see that. All right, so here we go. So uh, first thing we're actually gonna query for is a variable identifier. So, you know, we're in a, I've, I've, I've skipped, I either skipped or, oh, I'm sorry, we're in the restart. Um, first thing that we know, there's a matrix, or we believe there's a matrix variable in this file, right? Unless somebody's given us the wrong file, there's a matrix element in this file, matrix variable in this file. So the way that we um, get the ability to access that is by uh, inquiring for the identifier for that matrix, okay? So we, we call a function that says, hey, I think that there's a matrix variable in this uh, data set. Please give me back a reference to that data set, or to that variable. And so I get that reference in this var ID. Then um, we're gonna verify that the dimensions are what we expect. So um, the way we're gonna do that is we get a, a variable uh, dimension ID, and that gives us back actually two, L, two references, one to the columns and one to the rows. And so then we can verify via inquiring on the length of those dimensions that uh, the columns are what we expect and the rows are what we expect. Now, getting back to our friend's question earlier, if what we had wanted instead was for our, um, for our API to just discover the columns and rows and then allocate space and so forth, what we would be doing instead is pulling in these values and using them for memory allocation purposes, right? And using them to calculate my rows and, and um, my row offset, right? Um, then we're gonna allocate some space, and I, I was kind of lazy about uh, the functions here. Um, we're gonna all reduce to make sure everybody could allocate their memory, and then we're gonna read in um, the data that we, we were intending to read in. And in this case, um, I used a different flavor of access function that just reads into a contiguous array. And I just did that as an example of um, what it looks like to be lazy when you're doing I.O., basically. So I could have used a function that took an MPI data type and read straight into the, the buffer that my user passed in. Instead, I read into a contiguous buffer that I allocated in memory, and then I have to copy the data out into the array that the user uh, passed in in the first place, right? So this is kind of bad. You don't really want to do this sort of arbitrary copying. Um, but if you're, if you're lazy and you don't really like building up data types, um, that's a way to get around it. So the things to kind of keep in mind here, one, we didn't have to think about uh, offsets in the file at all. There was, obviously there is a file that this data was stored in, um, but we didn't have to interact with that file directly. Um, you know, instead we're thinking about arrays and dimensions of those arrays and types. Um, there's some metadata that's captured for us and we can interrogate the file and find out information about that file even though we didn't have to define that format. 
Um, and uh, this library and many of these libraries use MPIO underneath, so we get those IO transformations that we uh, discussed earlier without uh, really having to take advantage of them. And so next, uh, we're going to look at um, some other uh, net C some other net CDF examples, and also talk about some other libraries. And then later we'll talk about HDF, which is another another good uh, domain library that you might be interested in. Mm -hmm.